you know, while we're waiting, we're not starting at the live feed, but while we're waiting, I wanted to introduce um, Tina. Do you mind standing? Can I embarrass you? So, uh, not embarrass you, but recognize you. So, Tina works on us. People ask about studies and research. So, Tina works on us. She's a research coordinator at Cedar Sinai, and they've been doing, we've been doing these long term um, studies. So, really looking at people for, you know, along the course of their life with different medications, um, different treatment options, and monitoring their progress. It's a, it's a, it's a and now, the study you're doing now, people come in every six months. And they come in, they, you fill out, um, uh, do you want to talk about it? They, you fill out, okay, thank you. I'll, or I can struggle and stammer more. <laughs> wait, wait, hang on, hang on. Um, it's an observational study where we have people come in every six months. Um, during those visits, what we have you do is fill out a couple of questionnaires about your symptoms. Um, we do a blood draw doing the CRP and the SED rate, which is on the medical glossary that I saw. And um, we also have Dr. Weissman or Dr. Ishimori over at Cedar sinai do a joint exam. So it's a really great opportunity. They can come take a look at your symptoms, and you can also ask them questions if you have them. And then every two years, we also um, take x-rays. And so it's just a way for us to track your disease progression and for us to learn more about the disease. Yeah. See their Sinai Medical Center? Yeah, and there is a sign-up sheet outside um, where you're going to drop your evaluation forms. So if you want to learn more about the study, you can put down your information. And um, it's just going to be a way for me to contact you and tell you more about it. Uh, Enclosing spondylitis. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's just an observational study, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, we're ready to start with our next speaker. But first, I wanted to um, talk about the staff. So the Spinalized Association of America has um, a small staff, small professional staff. Um, we're blessed to have people who've been with the organization for many years. I think the average is probably seven or eight years. Um, and. I want to recognize them. So Lori, you already met, the executive director. Uh, Aline is the editor of Spondylitis Plus magazine. I'll bring that up during the next time I get up, on the, up at the podium. And she's, Aline's really responsible for everything that's gone right today. Um, <laughs> uh, Diane is out here. She's our director of annual giving. Robin um, Robin's also out here. And she, uh, she supports the support group leaders. So if, if there's a support group somewhere in the country and they need some support, they run. And also, she coordinates phone calls that we all chat about what's going on in support group. Um, so if someone wants to start a support group, that's the person you would talk with. And Robin also assists people who are doing fundraisers for the Spondylitis Association. So if someone is doing a, um, a, a fishing tournament or running a marathon or a 5K, uh, we've had people do gift wrapping in malls. Um, they, they coordinate, uh, Robin will support you in those efforts as well. So, um, so that's the staff that we brought here today. There's a few more that, that aren't here. So it's small staff, small administration, small administration costs, so or donations go to programs and research. All right, so let me move on to introducing, which is what I'm paid to do today. Um, help me welcome Dr. Lee. Olivia Lee is a board-certified ophthalmologist at Doheny Eye Center in Southern California. She is assistant professor at UCLA and is the full-time faculty at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm really so happy to see so many people in attendance, and I really congratulate all of you for the desire and effort to learn more about your condition, and I just think it's uh, wonderful, and it's going to allow you to really take better care of yourself, whether you've had uveitis before or not. So. Um, I am a ophthalmologist, which means I'm a uh, medical doctor um, specializing in the medical and surgical care of the eye, and more specifically, I am a uveitis specialist. So I've had extra training in specifically how to treat 
uh, uveitis, which is the topic of today's um, talk. So just to start off, I will be talking about some off-label medications that are FDA approved medications but not approved for the use in uveitis, and I don't have any financial interest in anything I'm going to be talking about today. So just as an introduction, uveitis, this word, means inflammation inside of the eye. This word uveitis by itself does not mean where is the inflammation inside of the eye, why you have the inflammation inside of the eye, or what we're going to do about it, what medication you, you need, or whether or not the patient will go blind. But this disease in general is, relatively speaking, quite rare. However, there's this misconception that it uh, uveitis necessarily means blindness. That's not necessarily true, but Overall, uveitis does account for 10% of reversible blindness in this country, and I'm hoping that we can reduce that number. Even though it's a rare condition, the patients who suffer from this uh, condition are typically in the younger age group. Most of them who suffer from uveitis are of the working age. And so even though this is a relatively rare disease, um, this disease can prevent patients from being productive members of society. They end up losing their jobs. They cannot care for themselves if they become legally blind. As such, the socioeconomic impact of this very rare condition equals that of diabetes, a very common condition. And 26% of patients with uveitis have it in association with some other kind of condition. And that brings me to this audience. So we'll talk a little bit more about that specifically in a moment. But just to give you uh, an understanding of some of the terms that I might use in today's talk, I want to just introduce you to the basic anatomy of the eye. This is the eye in cross-section. The light enters the eye from this direction, and it first hits the cornea. The cornea is the clear covering in front of your eye. If you wear contact lenses, that's what you're putting your contact lens on. You don't see the cornea if the cornea is normal because it is completely clear. The quote-unquote colored part of the eye is the iris. In this picture, it's blue. And the, circ the uh, empty space in the center of the iris is the pupil, or that dark black spot right in the center of your eye. The light entering the eye goes through the pupil, then through the lens. Now, everyone has is born with a clear lens in each eye. That lens allows you to focus light into the back of the eye where the light ends up hitting the retina. In here, uh, in this diagram, it's the orangish colored layer. It's a very thin layer that lines the inside of the eye. The retina collects the light impulses that enter the eye and then transmits those as neurologic signals through the optic nerve, which then goes to the brain, and your brain interprets what your eye sees. Now, we often talk about the eye in two chambers, the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber, or we might call that the front of the eye, the back of the eye. So for the purpose of today's talk, we're going to focus on the front of the eye, anywhere between the cornea, the iris, up to the lens. So the reason I bring that up is because uveitis just means inflammation inside of the eye. But you can have inflammation in the front of the eye, in the back of the eye, in both parts of the eye. Uh, for, you, for your purposes, spondyloarthropathies are associated mostly with anterior uveitis. So that means inflammation in the front chamber of the eye. The annual incidence overall is about eight people in 100,000 people will have this disease every year. Or over a lifetime, the cumulative incidence is less than 1%. So it's relatively rare. As I said, the primary site of inflammation varies depending on which type of uveitis it is, but in this case, it's in the front of the eye. So these other words, iritis, iridocyclitis, anterior cyclitis, they all mean the same things. We can use these terms interchangeably. So for the purpose of today's talk, I'm going to stick with the term anterior uveitis. But just in case you hear other people talking about iritis, it's all the same thing. It means inflammation in the front part of the eye. Then we can talk about the pattern of the disease. Acute means that you have inflammation in the eye that happens suddenly and then goes away. Recurrent means that you have 
the same thing happen over and over again, but there's a period of time that's greater than three months, could be a year, could be 15 years, when there's nothing happening. Whereas chronic means you treat the disease, it goes away, and in a few weeks or some period of time less than three months, it comes back again. And you can have any of these types of patterns for it with anterior uveitis. What are the symptoms? As a patient, what you would come in telling me if you had iritis is probably you have eye pain. Eye pain on the side that has the inflammation. Sometimes it's going to be both eyes. Most of the time, it's only going to be one eye. People are very light sensitive. In extreme cases, people say they want to go into a dark hole where there's no windows. You know, they'll often lock themselves into a closet, turn off all the lights, there's no windows, not even a speck of light can come through the blinds. I mean, it's that painful that any small amount of light can be very, very painful. And um, you can have blurred vision. Um, you may or may not have blurred vision to a certain degree. And also the eye is red. So I'll show you a few pictures of that. So the signs that we look for are the eye being red, like these two bottom photos, but more specifically a sign called ciliary flush, which is shown here. It means that the eye is more red around the cornea than elsewhere. The inflammation in the eye can cause scarring of the pupil. The pupil is supposed to be round like this, but in cases where you have inflammation in that area, you can get the iris being stuck or scarred down in certain places, and you can result in a funny-shaped pupil. As an ophthalmologist, I have a microscope in my office called the slit lamp microscope, and that magnifies the details of the eye for me so that I can actually see the inflammatory cells floating around in the eye. And if there's a lot of those inflammatory white blood cells, they can actually fall to the bottom of the eye by gravity, and you see that white layer there is actually clumps of those white blood cells that have fallen down to the bottom of the eye. Or you can see the clumps of white blood cells getting stuck on the back of the cornea. That's these little dots right here. More amazingly, when I use the uh, microscope in my office, I can actually look at the individual cells floating around inside the eye. And I can measure if you have more or less than you did last time. So if I can make an analogy, if, you're, uh, if you have the blinds partially open and there's a little beam of light that comes into the room and there's a little bit of dust in the room as well, when those little dust particles cross through that uh, beam of light, you can see the little dust particles. You see what I'm saying? So that's what I'm doing when I'm examining the eye. I make a beam of light that goes into the eye, and under high magnification, I can actually see the individual small cells pictured here. In a normal patient, you shouldn't see any of those cells. A normal patient shouldn't have any white blood cells inside of the eye. But when you have inflammation inside the eye, then you can actually see those cells. Many different conditions cause anterior uveitis, but the one that you all are most interested in is the ones that we call the HLA-B27 associated uveitis. But I just want to make a point that there's so many, and this is not even an exhaustive list, so many conditions that are associated with anterior uveitis. There are autoimmune conditions, there are infectious conditions, there are side effects of drugs that can cause uveitis, or there are idiopathic, meaning we haven't figured out what's causing that patient's inflammation. But for the purpose of today's um, discussion, I think you're all interested to know about the what we call HLA-B27 associated uveitis. Amongst those patients with anterior uveitis where we know they don't have an infection, and we assume that it's an immune problem, the immune system is attacking itself. Within that group of patients, the most common disease associated with anterior uveitis is HLA-B27, so the spondyloarthropathies. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the fact that this genetic marker is present in about 2 to 5 percent of the general population. But within patients who have uveitis, that percentage goes up to 50 percent. And within those patients, 45% of those will have some form of spondylarthropathy. Why isn't it 100%? So let's talk about that. 
So any type of seronegative spondyloarthropathy can be associated with uveitis. A lot of people think it's just ankylosing spondylitis, but that's not necessarily true. Inflammatory bowel disease, um, reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, any of them can be associated with uveitis. But what some people don't realize is that you can have HLA B, B27 associated uveitis in the absence of any diagnosed spondyloarthropathy. That is a common misconception. I have diagnosed patients with the eye disease only and then sent them back to their you know, non-eye doctor for the patient to be totally confused that the um, other doctors were not aware that they could have eye, the eye condition without the arthritis and then told the patient, oh, your doctor must be wrong, maybe you just have allergy eyes. So this is not true. There is, I have lots and lots of patients in my practice who don't have anything other than the eye. And maybe they will in the future develop symptoms, you know, back pain, etc. cetera, but um, you, it is definitely possible to have the uveitis in isolation. So a few more facts about this. The average age of patients at the time that they get their first episode of uveitis is 33 years. But I've seen it in adolescents. I've seen it in you know, 60-year-olds. So that is just a mean, but it really can happen at any time. The mean delay between the first symptoms of spondyloarthropathy and the first symptoms of uveitis is about 7.5 years. But it doesn't have to happen that way. They can happen simultaneously. It can, the eye symptoms can come first, or it could be decades between them. Um, it is typically more uh, affecting males more than females. Now, this is something I talk to my medical students and residents a lot about. There is a classic story or a typical story that a lot of the patients will say. Doesn't necessarily mean if you don't have this story that you don't have this condition, but this, the clinical course is usually characterized by recurrent, episodic, unilateral, alternating flares of acute anterior uveitis. Now, let, let me explain that, because uh, it's a, a mouthful. The patients will often say, I have inflammation in one eye, it affected this eye, then it went away, either by itself or with treatment, and then a certain period of time went by where nothing happened, everything was okay, and then bam, the other eye. Same thing happened to the other eye. That eye became red and inflamed, and either with treatment or by itself, it went away, and then another period of time passes, could be months, could be decades, and then other, the other eye goes. So it goes back and forth, right, left, right, left. This is a very classic story that um, patients with this condition will tell. So patients can present, yes, sir? Oh, is it possible for patients to be confused, or patients and the doctors, to uh, uh, confuse the symptoms of uh, infections. My infections with that kind of alternating pattern happen? Um, sure. I mean, I think that uh, if you look inside of the eye, you should be able to see the cells that are causing the inflammation that by definition happen with anterior uveitis as opposed to um, a pink eye, for example. But um, depending on what kind of doctor you go to see, if you don't go to see an eye doctor, that uh, you may not, they may not have that machine to make that diagnosis. Okay. Right. Okay. So, I mean, a red eye is very common. There are so many things that can cause a red eye. Um, and unless you see an ophthalmologist who has that machine to look deep inside the eye for the specific cells that I was talking about, it, it could be easy to um, not realize which kind of diagnosis you're looking at. Okay. So, going back to this, the presentation of uveitis and spondyloarthropathy, um, does it always happen together? Well, not necessarily. So. Um, speaking from my point of view, if a patient comes to me and they have uveitis, they could come saying they already know they have spondyloarthropathy. They could say, Doc, I have um, AS. But they could also come saying, I'm totally healthy. I have no medical problems at all. This thing just happened all of a sudden. I have no idea why. And then when I ask them, do you have low back pain? Do you have um, any gastrointestinal symptoms? Do you have a rash? They look at me funny like, aren't you an eye doctor? Why are you asking me these funny questions? And then they say, well, actually, 
yeah, my, my back does hurt. And I thought maybe I was just, you know, working out too hard at the gym or my posture wasn't very good. You know, and these are like 30-year-olds. They should, you know, it, that's not necessarily normal. But a lot of patients, it's not in their mind to tell their eye doctor about their non-eye symptoms. But then there are some patients who literally I've asked them every question and they say, no, I have no other symptoms at all. So it can happen any of these ways. And the other point I want to make is that the severity and pattern of the eye condition and the non-eye condition do not have to go hand in hand. You can have AS and your joint symptoms are completely well controlled, but the eye is you know, very, very inflamed. Or the opposite can happen. Both situations are possible. So patients can come in with their first episode of uveitis having had um, a history of the other eye maybe was inflamed at some point in the past, maybe they never went to see a doctor, maybe they just thought, oh, I got something stuck in my eye, I'll just ignore it and I'll wait it out, and you know, maybe it eventually did go away by itself. Or they went to see a non-eye doctor and they were given some antibiotic drops that maybe had nothing to do with the condition, but it would have gone away by itself. You know, maybe some patients, they remember having had that happened in the past. Or, the patient might say, this just happened completely out of the blue. I have no idea like, what I did. I didn't scratch myself. I didn't, you know, I didn't get hit in the eye. I, my eye just became red all of a sudden, and I don't know why. Or the patient might often will say, um, when I ask them, that something stressful has happened to them. They're undergoing some kind of emotional or psychological stress or some kind of physical stress, like they're getting over a cold or they just had some kind of accident. Um, any kind of stress on the body will affect the immune system and make these kind of episodes more likely to come out. And then the last thing I want to say here is something that I have noticed myself is that there are some patients who have never had any problem whatsoever and they go in to have routine elective eye surgery that has nothing to do with um, spinal arthropathy. Maybe they go in for LASIK, maybe they go in for cataract surgery, and bam, right after the surgery, they have an intensely inflamed eye. And the surgeon did nothing wrong. The surgery went just as expected. It's not a fault of the surgeon, but just unexpectedly, they developed a very intense inflammation due to the stress of having a surgery on the eye in a previously undiagnosed case. And I'll show you a, a specific story of that later on. So I just want to say a quick word about conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis in layman's terms is uh, pink eye. But I want to be very clear to say that not all pink eye is what you all think of as um, a, a virus or an infectious kind of pink eye where you get a lot of mucus coming out and it's really contagious. Not every kind of conjunctivitis is like that. So the kind of conjunctivitis that is associated with reactive arthritis is not that kind of infectious pink eye. You get the um, pink in the white part of the eye without any discharge, without any mucus or pus coming out of the eye. And unlike the condition I talked about previously, anterior uveitis, these patients don't have any inflammatory cells or any inflammation inside of the eye. There's no scarring of the pupil, etc. It's only the pink in the outer part of the eye. Now, admittedly, I don't see this very much, and I think that this is because the conjunctivitis will occur in both eyes, and it will occur around the time or within a few weeks of the joint symptoms occurring. And I think by that time, the patients are already know what's going on because they've gone to see their general doctor um, and they're already being treated. Generally speaking, this condition is much more mild. It doesn't cause blindness, and the treatment that is given for the joint disease will make the eye condition go away. Now, going back to uveitis, what is the treatment? So I want to describe to you what is the classical treatment, and then we'll talk about uh, what if this kind of treatment doesn't work. So the classic treatment is two different types of medications. The first one is a dilation drop. So you recognize, you'll recognize the red top drops that the eye doctors have in their office that they put in your eyes to dilate the pupil, make the pupil really large so that they can examine the back of the eye. We use these in the office for that purpose. In this case, why are we dilating the eye? Two reasons. One is because if you have a lot of inflammation in the eye, the pupil can become scarred to the rest of the eye. And we don't want that to happen because that scarring is often permanent. So by 
moving the pupil outwards, it can uh, allow for the scarring to not become permanent. Thank you. <laughs> the other reason is because the iris is a muscle. When you go into a, uh, a bright, uh, go out into bright sunlight, your pupil comes down. When you go into a, a dark movie theater, the pupil gets bigger. That movement is controlled by a muscle inside of the iris. And that muscle gets really sore when there's inflammation in the eye. Think of it as your muscles are already sore and then you go to lift weights. Of course, it's going to make it more sore. That's why those patients have light sensitivity. By giving them the dilation drops, it's paralyzing those muscles, relaxing those muscles, and that really helps with the symptom of light sensitivity. Now, the other treatment is the more important one, which is um, steroid eye drops. So I'm sure you've all heard of prednisone that you take as pills, right? So this is analogous to that, but it's in eye drop form. And, you, and it comes in different, there are different um, forms of steroid, but the point is that they're all trying to reduce the inflammation inside of the eye. The drop gets absorbed by the eye and uh, reduces the inflammation inside of the eye. A very typical regimen, but it depends on each patient and depends on their severity, is for a very severe, um, acute episode of uveitis, a typical um, way I would prescribe these drops is I would tell the patient, when you get to the pharmacy and you get the drops, for the first hour, put one drop every 15 minutes. Make sure you shake the bottle because the medication tends to fall to the bottom of the bottle. If you don't shake it, you're not actually getting the medicine in the eye. After the first hour, you can use it every hour or maybe every two hours if it's not as bad while you are awake. If it's really severe, sometimes we ask the patients to wake up in the middle of the night every hour to put the drops. But more likely, um, if they really need that much medication, you can prescribe an ointment form so they have medication in the eye during the hours that they are sleeping. And then once it's improved or resolved, then we slowly taper the drops off. I'm sure you've heard that you know, if you take prednisone pills, you also don't want to stop cold turkey. But this is something that a lot of patients don't understand. So I'm glad you're all here to listen to this because a very typical story will be, oh doc, once I started the drops, I felt so much better and my vision came back and my eye wasn't red. And so I didn't think I needed the drops anymore. I didn't think I needed to come back to see you anymore. And anyway, the, the bottle was empty, so I just stopped. And then, Two weeks later, it came back even worse. What happened? Well, it's because they stopped cold turkey. So you'd never want to do that with steroids. Um, once the patient is better, we slowly or gradually reduce the dose until they get completely off. Otherwise, you can develop what's called a rebound effect, where the inflammation could be even worse than it was the first time. Now, ideally, we'd like to get the patient completely off the drops, then they have no more inflammation and everybody's happy. But sometimes, it's impossible to get them off the drops because once you get down to a certain level, they start having the inflammation again. So there are some patients who require a low dose of the drops for a long term. Now, I'm not talking about every hour, every two hours, but you know, there are some patients that I have on, you know, they only use one drop maybe every other day um, to keep the inflammation under control. We wouldn't want to do a lot of it because then you'd get side effects from these drops, but something like twice a week is not that bad. But what about the atypical cases? So those are the cases that I see a lot because the traditional treatment works for a lot of patients and those patients um, can easily be taken care of by a normal ophthalmologist. But what about the ones that you know, you're doing the drops and you're asking the patient to do it every hour, waking up in the middle of the night and they're still not getting better? What about those cases? So sometimes we, we do give prednisone pills um, and I think you're, you've probably all heard about why, um, using prednisone pills for your joint symptoms, et cetera. Um, another way we can treat it as eye doctors is to give that medication as an injection near the eye. It sounds much worse than it is. Um, it's, <laughs> it's really not that bad and it can be done in the office without any anesthesia in just a matter of seconds. And it's really not very painful. And I, I give the analogy of you put the entire bottle of drops behind your eye. You get a really big dose initially when the inflammation is very, very severe. And for the next several weeks or months, it slowly releases and you have a little bit of medicine that keeps going for a while. And that can be very helpful for patients who have a severe episode. What about if the inflammation is coming back 
constantly and you just can't control it and you're having to give a lot of steroid, the patients are getting side effects from them. So like, what are the side effects of steroid on the eye? Well, one, it can cause a cataract. Now, cataract by itself doesn't sound so bad. Every one of us is going to get a cataract if we live long enough. All our grandparents have cataracts and they had cataract surgery. It doesn't sound like that bad. But there are certain circumstances in which you really want to make sure a patient doesn't get a cataract, namely children. I mean, children shouldn't be having cataracts. Uh, if they get cataracts too young, um, it really can affect their entire lives. Also, the eye drops can cause an increase in the eye pressure, which leads to a, another eye condition called glaucoma. The scary thing about glaucoma is that when you lose vision from glaucoma, you can't get it back. You can't say 10 years later, oh, can you do some kind of magical surgery on me to get my vision back from the glaucoma? It'll be too late. So we want to really make sure the patients don't develop glaucoma. There are about 15% of patients that just have a predisposition to developing high pressure as a reaction to using these steroid eye drops. So under these special circumstances, we, don't, we want to try to avoid using the steroids either as eye drops or as an injection. And sometimes it's just too severe, even with all of our efforts using local therapy, we can't get the eye under control. Or what if one eye is already blind and the other eye is about to go blind? We really want to treat those patients aggressively. For these special situations, we consider the immunosuppressive drugs that you heard about earlier today. If you are a patient who is already on these, it actually is serving double duty the uh, immunosuppressive drugs can help your other disease, um, your, your arthritis, you know, uh, the bowel disease, but it can also help the eye. Now this is where my initial disclosure comes in. None of these drugs are FDA approved specifically for the use in uveitis. And that's not because they don't work. That's because uveitis is a relatively rare disease and it's not worth, it's not easy to do a study just to get uh, a label for this particular disease. But as you all know, if any of you are on these drugs like methotrexate, like Humira or Remicade, uh, like Celsept, they do work um, if you find the right one that works for you. And similarly for the eye, we also use them to treat eye inflammation in these special cases. I will make a note though that um, for some reason, Embril works great for joint disease not so good for the eye. And we um, have learned that that's not because the drug isn't good, but for whatever reason, it's just not so effective for the eye. But the drugs that are very similar to it, Humira, Remicade, the other TNF-alpha inhibitors seem to work very well for the eye. So I have some patients who are doing really well on Embril for their joint disease, but I can't get their eye under control. So I just have them switch over to another um, medication that's similar like Humira or Remicade. What are the complications of uveitis if you don't treat it properly or it's undertreated or treated too late? There are so many things that can happen and they all can lead to irreversible blindness. So I want to educate you about these things. So we've we're gonna talk a little bit more about cataracts. So I'll skip over this for a second, but I've showed you um, before this picture that you can get these parts of the iris scarred down and then the pupil becomes a very abnormal shape. That's why we like to give the dilating drops to break those scar tissue, which only can happen if you do it right away, or to prevent them from happening. I like this picture because it's kind of cute. It's like a smiley face um, showing that what happens if you, you know, treat it properly, you can break those scar tissues. And these, um, the, the eye and the smiley face are made up of pigment that came from the iris when it was stuck down. And as it was released, it still left some pigment there. Um, so that is because this patient is receiving the dilating drops that that happened. Um, if this is even more severe, you can grow an inflammatory membrane that covers the pupil. So this pupil is not only scarred down, but you see this white film. It's actually a sheet of inflammatory tissue that got stuck to the iris and it's physically blocking the vision. This is another patient that the pupil is scarred down, also has an inflammatory membrane, but look at this white stuff here. That is actually calcium that's built up on the cornea. Again, the cornea is the clear covering in front of the colored part of your eye. It's supposed to be totally transparent. But if you have uncontrolled uveitis for many years, you'll develop this calcium that's starting to build up, and it's sort of like the um, cornea becomes like frosted glass. 
But if this gets even more severe, then the calcium builds up so much that it literally blocks the vision and it's like there's chunks of chalky rocks in your eye. When you blink, you feel really, really uncomfortable because it's like there's rocks stuck in your eye. I mean, it's literally calcium chunks on the eye. And uh, we also talked about glaucoma. The glaucoma can be caused by both the drops and the disease. Uveitis itself can cause glaucoma. And, if it's, um, and I told you that the kind of uveitis we're talking about today is in the front of the eye. But it can also, if severe, spill over into the back of the eye and cause swelling of the retina and floaters, which are opacities inside the jelly that fill the eye, and it looks like there's bugs floating around in your vision. So we want to treat uveitis promptly so that you don't get all those complications. Once you get all those complications, it's really, really hard to fix them. Um, mostly you need to rely on surgery to fix them. And we'll talk a little bit more about surgery in a second. So, Let's talk uh, uh, briefly about cataracts. So what is a cataract, first of all? You, a lot of people have heard about cataracts, but maybe you don't know exactly what it is. A cataract means clouding of the lens. Everybody is born with a clear lens in each eye. When you're a baby, it's crystal clear, and it helps you focus light into the back of the eye. In a normal patient, over time, with aging and sun exposure, that lens becomes cloudier and cloudier in a gradual manner until when you're elderly it's so cloudy that it's hard to see through then you need cataract surgery to remove it and normal run-of-the-mill cataract surgery is done in elderly patients it's a very simple procedure takes maybe 10 to 15 minutes it's an outpatient procedure it's very easy to recover from but in in this condition when you have uveitis and a cataract, specifically the uveitis caused the cataract, it's a whole different ballgame. So let's talk about this. Cataract formation is a common complication of patients who have uveitis, and this occurs because of two reasons. One is the disease itself. Having inflammation right next to the lens will cause it to become cloudy, especially if it's inflammation that goes on for a long time. Also, the drops, uh, the steroid drops and prednisone pills or the steroid injection themselves can cause a cataract. So you could be taking prednisone pills for something completely unrelated to the eye and develop a cataract. So both of these things together can lead you to develop a cataract. And so these patients with uveitis who develop a cataract tend to be much younger than the patients who develop a cataract naturally because of aging. So a typical cataract patient is probably you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s having cataract surgery. But these patients can be children, adolescents, people in their you know, 20s, 30s. They can be really young people. Um, and the surgery is not so easy to do. The overall incidence of cataract formation in patients with HLA B27 associated uveitis is 21%. But for the individual patient, the more severe your inflammation is, the more drops you need, the more likely you're develop, you will be to develop a cataract. So let's talk about if you do have a cataract, then what do you do? Then you have cataract surgery. Well, you heard me just say cataract surgery is so simple, it's just a 15 minute procedure, but not, for, not necessarily for these types of patients. That's because they not only have a cataract, but they have the inflammation to deal with. So you can't treat inflammation with surgery itself. So the inflammation needs to be really, really well controlled before you can even consider having surgery, because the surgery itself will incite even more inflammation. So I like to tell my patients that they have to be completely inflammation-free in their eye for a minimum of three months, but the longer would be better. Sometimes I insist on even more than three months. The surgery itself is not easy to do because of the other complications of chronic inflammation that we talked about previously. Scarring of the pupil. You have to break up all that scar tissue first before you can even access the cataract, which is behind the pupil. These cataracts tend to be much more dense or more mature, more ripe than the typical cataracts that we are operating on in um, elderly patients. The support structures within the eye can be very weak because they've been attacked by the inflammation. And then specific to pa patients with AS, they have difficulty positioning themselves in the manner that we need them to be during the cataract surgery, and I'll show you that in a moment too. So for the, the next um, couple slides, I want to just give you some specific patient stories, examples of my own patients, to show you some examples of what can happen. 
So this, um, this story is about a 23-year-old lady who was nearsighted and she went to go get LASIK because she didn't want to wear glasses anymore. She never had any medical problems. The LASIK went just fine, but after the LASIK, intense inflammation in this eye. And because of that inflammation, the doctor was completely stumped, didn't know what was going on, tested her, she's got HLA-B27 but she doesn't have any other signs or symptoms. She has no back pain, no rash, etc. It was so intense, the inflammation that she had, that she developed all this scarring on her pupil. And remember, this is a 23-year-old person that had perfect vision in glasses and just wanted to get out of glasses. The scarring, when it gets too intense, it can close off the pupil completely. And the eye is constantly making fluid and the fluid that's made by the eye has to also be drained. There has to be a balance between the eye making fluid and releasing fluid. Otherwise, the pressure goes up. Well, when the pupil gets scarred down completely, the fluid is trapped in the eye. It can't get out, and this is what happens. It's like fluid is ballooning up the iris. It can't get out. Now the eye pressure goes skyrocketing high. It's three to four times the normal eye pressure, and that's intensely painful and can cause uh, permanent loss of vision because the high pressure in the eye damages the optic nerve that carries the signal of light from the eye to the brain. So if you fix it afterwards, if the nerve is dead, your brain will never know what you're seeing anyway. So this is an emergency and at, it wasn't until this point that the patient um, came to see me. So to get the inflammation under control as fast as possible, I gave her a high dose of um, prednisone pills. She was taking them, she was starting to feel better, and then she got on a plane and went back to her country uh, where she had the original LASIK done, and she was feeling so great because now the eye's not painful, the eye's not red, but she's still taking the prednisone pills. So she goes back to the uh, original doctor who sees all this scarring and the cataract and says, oh, what happened to you? We gotta fix this. So um, that doctor did this um, cataract surgery. So you see all the scarring that was on the pupil. He opened it really nicely. Actually, this is a beautiful surgical result. This is actually, must have been a very skilled surgeon because this is the picture the patient brought back with her. I mean, this looks really great. Here's the thing. The patient ran out of her prednisone pills and the surgeon just, you know, was more concentrating on doing the surgery than thinking about, oh, what will happen to this? Then it blew up again. And so then she didn't know what to do, got back on a plane, came back to see me, and this is the result. There's scarring everywhere. The pupil is completely blocked with scar tissue. And this is blindness that can't, really can't be fixed. So what would have been a better way to approach this problem? So this is a happy story. So this patient um, had uveitis, both eyes, had cataracts because of the uveitis. We were planning on getting everything under control, you know, taking our time to get everything under control. We are gonna start her on um, a systemic medication to suppress her immune system to get the eyes under control in preparation for surgery. But then she got pregnant. And you know that when you're pregnant, you cannot take these drugs, right? So what did we do? During the course of her pregnancy and while she was breastfeeding, we didn't want to give her any medication that could be systemically absorbed. We didn't even want to give her eye drops in case you know, some of the eye drops get absorbed. So we treated her with steroid injections because when we inject the steroid behind the eye, it doesn't go anywhere else, won't harm the baby, won't get into the breast milk. So we gave these steroid injections to the eye until she stopped breastfeeding. And once she stopped breastfeeding, you know, we said, okay, you're not gonna have any more children, right? Not, not, at least not right now. So then we gave the medication, waited until everything had been stable for quite a while, and then did the cataract surgery. And when she woke up from the cataract surgery, she could see so well, she saw her two-year-old daughter for the first time. And she was so happy that she went to the newspaper and made a big deal out of it, and that's why she's on the cover of the newspaper. <laughs> okay, so I wanna tell you one more story. So this is a patient of mine who has AS. Unfortunately, this patient never took immunosuppressive drugs, ever. He was ever only treated with prednisone for his, his, the whole course of, since his diagnosis. So he's in a wheelchair because um, his neck is fused and he's had fractures because of the side effects of the prednisone, so he's wheelchair bound. 
This is him trying to sit up straight and lift his head straight as much as he can, because I'm asking him to do that for the purpose of taking the picture. This is me trying to examine him in my office. Now, if you've ever had an eye exam, um, this is the microscope that the eye doctor looks through to look at your eye. There's a chin rest. You're supposed to put your chin on the chin rest and your forehead up to the bar so that the eye doctor can look at your eye. You see, he can't even get his chin in the chin rest. And what you're not seeing is that he's leaning all the way forward. His brother and his cousin are behind him, pushing him forward. And it, he's in pain while I'm trying to get a two-second look at each eye. He had dense, very, very mature cataracts in both eyes as a result of really never having his eyes properly treated. So, you know, I got the inflammation under control and then ready to do cataract surgery. So we do cataract surgery with the patient laying down flat. There's a microscope that comes down over the patient's head. The patient's head is here. I'm sitting here, I'm looking into the microscope, looking down into the eye, and the eye is facing up towards the ceiling. Well, when this patient lays flat on the bed, because his neck is completely fused, his head is facing the wall, not the microscope. So, and his, there's, there's all this space between the back of his head and actually the headrest. So we've put as many, we've um, put as many pillows under the headrest as possible, but he's still like this. So here are the nurses strapping him in, getting ready to tilt the bed to try to get his eyes to face more up. And they're afraid that he's gonna slip off the bed and fall on the floor. That's why they've strapped him in with these straps. And then they've tilted the bed as much as it can go, and his eye is still at a 45 degree angle. So this is probably the hardest surgery I've ever had to do, not only because the eye was so scarred and the cataract was so dense, but also because the patient was so uncomfortable, all of his weight was on the back of his neck. Furthermore, he couldn't have general anesthesia because the um, anatomy of his neck, they couldn't put the breathing tube down his neck. So he was awake the whole time. And his legs are up here, right next to my ears, and I don't even have room for my right arm, which is the hand I did the surgery with. So my point is, you know, if this patient had been treated differently, he would not have be in this position where his, um, uh, his neck is fused where he can't straighten his head, he can't straighten his neck, he can't and, uh, look towards the um, microscope. And his eye wouldn't have been in such severe condition as well. So I just want to end with a summary of all the points that we've talked about today. So eye inflammation in the form of either anterior uveitis or conjunctivitis can be associated with spondyloarthropathy. HLA B27 associated uveitis can occur with or without spondyloarthropathy and it can occur with any type of spondyloarthropathy. The presentation of uveitis um, consists of symptoms of eye redness, eye pain, light sensitivity. Uveitis, if uh, untreated or partially treated or very, very severe, can result in cataract formation, scarring of the iris and pupil, and in um, some cases, irreversible blindness. Treatment of uveitis usually involves steroid eye drops, but in some atypical cases that we talked about, other kinds of therapy are necessary. And cataract surgery in, in eyes with uveitis is really complicated, but can be successful if you pay attention to the medical treatment to control the inflammation as well. So that concludes what I have for you today. Um, and I really thank you for all being here. And I'm happy to take any questions from the audience if you have them. Yes. Is Lucentis, because um, I've had Lucentis injections in my eye for permanent eye loss, um, vision loss, is that a corticosteroid infection? No. I, you have macular degeneration as well? No. They don't know why I have it. Um, it you think it's being given for uveitis? I, it's more in the back of my eye, so I know it doesn't affect mm -hmm. this. And yes. I had um, just... A real one day I woke up and I couldn't see the computer I couldn't see anything but and have you been diagnosed with UVI has that been said to you that it's no UVI? I, I haven't see. been diagnosed with anything because I see. they okay. just I didn't have insurance at the time and they oh. just so I did the monthly you sent injections okay in my eye so 
Um, to answer your question, Lucentis is not a steroid. Okay. Lucentis is a drug that um, shrinks abnormal blood vessels. Typically, Lucentis is um, described in the use uh, for the treatment of macular degeneration, which is completely unrelated to uveitis, although I'm sure there could be a coincidence where a patient has both uveitis and that. But, um, you know, it can be used in other circumstances as well, but most commonly it's used for macular degeneration. So I'm thinking that, you know, I, I don't, don't totally understand by your story what it exactly is the diagnosis, or I guess you don't know either. So, um, yeah, but it's not a steroid. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I don't know if I had, I had AS now. I don't know if I had it then. Mm -hmm. In 1990, I had this eye nucleated because of an accident oh. at Doheny. Yes. And <clears throat> uh, You mean an accident like you had some kind of trauma I had something to go eye. over my face and oh. the doctor said to oh. go to Doheny as opposed to Stein because they see more accidental things in champagne <laughs> courts. I mean, really, that's what he told me. And he was affiliated with Doheny, but uh -huh. he had a private practice. Uh, I know I'm forming a cataract. My ophthalmologist, who I see two, three times a year, said he'll never operate on it. Never? Never, because of, uh, you know, the, the risk. Oh. And it's, he said it's very, very small, and I'm 80 years old, okay? I used to have floaters. I don't see floaters anymore. I'm taking prednisone. What I've recently noticed within the past six months or so is that I have a lot of tearing in my seeing eye, I, an unusual amount, and I don't know. You know, he said it's no big deal. Can you see out of that eye? Oh, I see very well. I drive, oh, I have good. my driver's license, I have no problem. Mm. Well, I hope uh, it stays that way. Well, I hope so too. Mm -hmm. But is it tearing any, any relation to the uveitis? Uh, tearing by itself, in the absence of all the other symptoms, shouldn't be... No red. Doesn't sound like yeah. it, right. And if you are under the constant care of an ophthalmologist, I'm sure, knowing that you have AS, they are looking every time to make sure you don't have inflammation inside the eye. I hope so. <laughs> he said my pressure is good. Well, that's great. That's and, good. Uh, I recently lost my prosthesis because I had a head cold and it fell out. And I mm. found it in the laundry. Oh. <laughs> but uh, uh -huh. uh, the, the eyelids were red mm. and inflamed at that particular time. And on the other eye, the, on your left eye. On my left eye. Yes. But well, the good thing is that because you were nucleated, you really can't have uveitis in your left eye. So at least you don't need to worry that that was uveitis. Oh, I know that. Right. I know that. Yeah. I know that. But uh, the, the big thing, the tearing concerned me because uh, whether he is aware of the AS or not, the uveitis, we've never discussed it. But he said, everything looks good. Your pressure's good. Cataract hasn't grown anymore. We'll probably never have to deal with it. Well, I hope that's I hope that's true. If you uh, live a very very long time, that might not always be true, though. <laughs> With simple aging, the cataracts can advance. So, um, but it's it's good to hear that you don't have any problems in your your only eye. That's great. Yes. I just wondered if you had any Same time after. Yeah. So the question was about shingles and uveitis. So you mean to say that you had uveitis before and then you developed shingles or the shingles no. caused the uveitis? No, first I had uveitis and then shingles. I see. So, um, shing so for everyone in the audience to understand, shingles is a viral infection. Uh, caused by the same virus that causes chickenpox. So if you ever had chickenpox when you were a child, um, that virus goes away at that time, but it becomes dormant inside of your body. It picks one nerve somewhere in your body to go to sleep. And at some point in the future, it may come out again and only affect the area where that nerve is located. And that is called shingles. And it can be very painful. It can cause uh, blisters on the skin, um, inflammation in that area only, not the whole body. In terms of the eye, what we are most concerned about is 
shingles occurring in this section. So if the virus went to sleep and it just happened to pick the nerve that serves the front of the scalp, the forehead, the eye, the tip of the nose, mm -hmm. then when the shingles comes out, you could get shingles inside of your eye. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean yes. that everyone who has shingles in this area will have inflammation inside the eye or uveitis, but it is possible. And that's why anytime you have the, um, the shingles spots on the forehead, especially if you have it on the tip of the nose, you really have to see an eye doctor to make sure there's no inflammation inside the eye. And, and so I, I wound up with a, a scar on oh, my eye. Mm -hmm. And um, I continued to have pain um, in that eye, mm -hmm. severe pain. Mm -hmm. um, and at night, you know, when I get up, and it's swollen. And so I wondered, can uveitis be occurring without the redness? Or is it just it's a possible. result? Is it just inflammation without uveitis? Well, inflammation is. could be uveitis, right. So uh, what you're asking is, could, what, I think what you're asking is, can it be recurrent? So a lot of people think that shingles just comes, it's terrible at the moment, and then goes away, it doesn't come back. But you can get recurrent pain afterwards. The pain does not necessarily mean that the inflammation has come back, but it can. The problem with pain is that the shingles affects the nerves. And so you can have pain even though there's nothing actually causing the pain because the nerves are altered. So the function of the nerves can be altered and you can get pain called post-herpetic neuralgia. That just means you've had shingles in that area before. The nerves aren't working right and they're telling you you have pain when, there shouldn't, when it shouldn't be painful. But you can, separate from that, you can also have the inflammation recur sometimes. So some people, there are some medications that can be given for this. Um, I don't know if you're trying that, but but there are. Yes. An injection into my eye mm -hmm. uh, to help uh, me not go blind, and then uh, five years later, I had someone uh, an optometrist because the area I lived in didn't have an ophthalmologist he said that it appeared that I was having iritis mm -hmm. but with her situation I then developed shingles mm. and it was in the same area of my eye and they couldn't differentiate between the shingles because it was and mm -hmm. I did have the lesion on my nose mm -hmm. and so they went ahead and treated it with the steroid because yeah. that was how they would have treated one or the other Right. Um, since that, I still have pain around my eye in the bone and somewhat tenderness in the muscle, although they don't think I have iritis at this time. Mm -hmm. um, what can be done about the pain that uh, lingers and stays after you have had iritis? Or you still have iritis, but you've had the incident? I, I think you mean what about the pain after the shingles, yeah? yeah. Right. So uh, yeah. if, it, if it's the B27 associated iritis, if the iritis goes away, you should not, when it's quiet, have pain. But I think in, both of you are saying similar things, is that you had the shingles in that area, and that the eye that had the shingles, it would only be on one side. It wouldn't be the other side, right? So the B27 can go both eyes, and this is what I had said earlier. It could be one eye goes away, the other eye goes away, but not shingles. Shingles would only be on the side where you have the rash. And, and I've had shingles on both. I've had iritis on both eyes. Mm -hmm. So that was the... But it's only on the side that you have the shingles that you're still having So pain, you're saying right? the pain is the result of the shingles and not the iritis. Sounds like it. Mm. So there are medications that can, that can be suggested for post-herpetic neuralgia. So some people think that if you keep taking the antiviral pills that that might help the pain. And then there is also you know, pain uh, medication to target the nerve, like something like Lyrica, that can maybe help with that as well. Mm -hmm. Yes? I started my um, spondylitis journey with a scleritis, which happened mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. matter of five minutes, and mm -hmm. it was pretty severe. Um, and he gave me... Uh, the ophthalmologist gave me Indocin, and mm -hmm. I had to take three months of that. Uh -huh. um, I had it again just uh, two years later. This mm -hmm. was recently. 
and he said it was scleritis and episcleritis. Mm -hmm. I'm wanting to know the differences. Mm -hmm. And keratitis, which I think is dry mm -hmm. eye. So I mm -hmm. have everything yeah. <laughs> in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Does it all happen at once, or can it, is it a domino effect, or uh, does this all come under the term uveitis? Um, well, uveitis is a very umbrella term that just means inflammation inside the eye. Now, scleritis, keratitis, and episcleritis, the terms that you just mentioned, are all, they are inflammation, but not inside of the eye. I mean, this is just terminology is what I'm explaining. So for the rest of the audience to understand, scleritis and episcleritis means inflammation of the white part of the eye. So... Um, depending on how deep that inflammation goes, if it's very superficial or just on the surface, we call that episcleritis. If it's very deep into the white part of the eye, we call that scleritis. If you also have inflammation of the cornea, we call that keratitis. So I don't want to make things too complicated, but you can have uveitis in combination with any of these things. For you, I know, I think if you have AS or you have, right, so you have a predisposition because of your problem with the immune system to have inflammation in the eye. The most common form is uveitis, like we talked about, but it's also possible to have inflammation of other parts of the eye. So I don't know if that means that your systemic disease is not well controlled, but it sounds like the eye inflammation is getting out of control. So if the indocin is not enough, you know, there are stronger things, you know, that can be uh, tried as well. Any other yes. question? Uh, one more. Uh, uh, yes. Have you seen a coincidence of depression during, uh, during uh, uveitis flare-ups? Um, I haven't necessarily looked into that, but I, I do ask the patients when they come in um, with a flare, you know, what's been going on, because a lot of times they can, they, they will know, you know, I've been going through a really rough time at work, and I've had like a, um, some big deadline to, co to meet, or, you know, I'm having problems in, at home with my marriage or something, some kind of stressor. It's so not really what I'm like talking that. about, because right. um, in the times that I've had uh, uveitis flare-ups, um, a lot of times it will go into like a really deep crushing depression that will only happen during that time. That's, hmm. that's not related to anything that's happening in my life. Hmm. And uh, even some paranoid thoughts and things like that that just seem to happen with the uh, coincidence of the uveitis. That I haven't noticed. Okay. I haven't noticed that. All right. Maybe I need to ask patients more. <laughs> We've seen, yeah, as I've done some research, there, there have been some papers connecting the two. I'm just wondering if mm. you had seen something like that. Mm. I will pay attention from now on. Thank you. About dry eyes? Dry eyes? So dry eye is actually a very common condition. Many, many patients have dry eye, whether they have an inflammatory disease or not. Um, a very um, typical kind of dry eye that is associated with an inflammatory condition is called Sjogren's syndrome. Um, but that is a completely different disease, um, and sometimes you can have more than one disease, one more than one autoimmune disease at a time. But dry eye by itself, just having dry eye by itself, doesn't necessarily make me think that I need to check the patient for spondyloarthropathy. But dry eye is very common here, actually, because our air is very dry, um, so. And it's becoming more and more of a problem. I think people are spending too much time on the computer. Uh, so it's a very common problem all across the board. Anything? Yes. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the conjunctivitis uh, as opposed to uveitis, because my daughter who has it has um, very, sorry, uh, the white of her eye was more pink. Like the pictures you showed, uh -huh. the eyes were super red. Yeah. But they, um, and she's had it like once a year, um, but more like a light pink. And then she went to an ophthalmologist, and because she has AS, they said she had uveitis, and she did the dilating and mm -hmm. the drops, and it helped, and everything's great. But when you mentioned conjunctivitis, she didn't have the, the mucus, but it looked more like that than uveitis. Is that See, because, also a symptom? No. I, well, when you have uveitis, the eye will become red as well. And 
what I'm talking about for conjunctivitis means in the absence of uveitis. The uveitis will come with the eye being red, but because you don't have the microscope to look inside the eye, it, to you from the outside, it, it all, they all look like a red eye. So from the outside, you know, if like I were to take my iPhone and take a picture of you, if the eye is red, even I, looking at a simple photograph, would not be able to tell the difference between conjunctivitis, episcleritis, scleritis, uveitis. I wouldn't be able to tell. So it sounds like what your daughter has is actually uveitis, but what you can tell is that the eye around the eye is red. So you're saying that she doesn't have pain, she doesn't have light sensitivity, is that what you mean? I don't, I don't remember her complaining, but it was more of a pink, pink, yeah. not really dark red. So when I saw right. that, I thought, oh, so, she has but, conjunctivitis, not uveitis. Oh, no, 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 not necessarily. No, no, okay. So there are different levels of severity, and I'm, some of the pictures I showed you are the really bad ones. Okay. Right. Um, now, I will say that some kids, she, is, is she very young? She's 19. Did you, oh, when, she's did start? when did it start, though? Um, she was diagnosed at 19, but I think she's had it since 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. I see. When undiagnosed. But the, the eye is a once-a-year thing, mm -hmm. seems mm -hmm. to be. And I, I don't know. I guess I thought, oh, it's not uveitis, it's conjunctivitis, but oh, it only because it looked not as severe. You're right. But that's not what you're trying to say. Right, right, okay. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Earlier on your slides, you mentioned that patients between uh, uveitis will happen patients 30 to 60 years old. Does it mean after 60 years old patients? No, I think that's the most most common, but I but it can really happen at any time. Yeah. One more question? Yes. Last one. So is it possible to thank you. Is it possible to see somebody who had uveitis and it's cleared on its own and you can see yeah, you had it, but it cleared and it didn't leave any scarring, or? If you had uveitis and it went away completely on its own without any treatment, and um, at the time when you go to see the doctor, there's nothing going on, there's no inflammation, it would be hard to make that diagnosis after the fact. Although, sometimes I look at the eye and I can tell that the patient had a severe uveitis previously because I can see all the scarring or I can see the pigment that was left from you know the iris touching um, the lens um, so I can see small clues like that but to be definitive about making the diagnosis it would be hard if it was a very mild case that then went away without really any consequence that would be the question that I would probably ask my ophthalmologist when he had said to me when he when I before I had been diagnosed with AS and my eyes were really impacted by it um, by what he believes was uveitis so mm -hmm. maybe I should ask when he says I think that you had it but it went away on its own you were very lucky that it didn't do more damage yeah it sounds That's as possible. if sure. he may be seeing scar tissue that I'm not understanding he's actually seeing mm -hmm. left over from yeah that's possible um, so nobody saw you at that time no, it, I was in the middle of being diagnosed, and I was really sick, and by the time I was able to get into the ophthalmologist, you know, You had already been really treated for your AS or for, with something else, and it all went away. Yeah, I and, see, I see. and so it had already started to calm down, but he had mentioned that it, it seems that you may have had well, this, it. The story does sound typical, so just listening to the story without even looking, I would tend to agree. Um, okay. But perhaps you should ask if there if you have any scarring or anything like that. Okay. But I'm assuming that your vision is good, I hope. I think it is, but okay. I, that was my other question. Are you taking new patients? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, um, my, my office is primarily in Pasadena. Um, we also have a office in Arcadia, Orange County, and then the main UCLA campus I don't go to, but there's uveitis specialists there too um, in Westwood. So um, not every patient with uveitis needs a uveitis specialist necessarily, but especially those really tough cases where it doesn't respond to the typical treatment, uh, or it's very, very severe, or it's very recurrent, or has already caused blindness, sometimes those patients would benefit from a consultation with a uveitis specialist. And you know, we're very lucky in this area that there's a, there are uveitis specialists, but there are entire countries or states where there's no uveitis specialist at all. So I'm really happy you all are here to even know what uveitis means, actually. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you.